You know, drinks and food, they come together. Okay. You know, they're part of the same thing. You don't really separate them. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you eat, you drink. Welcome to the Lush Life Podcast. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, and I bring you the how-to guide for living life one cocktail at a time. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by cocktails ever since. Together, we'll learn from bartenders, brand ambassadors, distillers, and others why certain drinks are popular in certain cultures, how to make the perfect old-fashioned, when to shake and when to stir, and so much more. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let the fun begin. Do you love Lush Life Podcast but don't know how to show it? Nominate us for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award, the Oscars of the drinks industry. They have a new entry for best broadcast, online video series, or podcast. Perfect. All you have to do is go to talesofthecocktail.org backslash events backslash spirited dash awards or check out the link on my homepage. Fill in the form and voila, so easy and so appreciated. Thank you for your support. The family of our guest today views the world by what is edible and what is not edible. It's not a shock that Valentine Warner would become one of the most well-known chefs in the UK. Working hand in hand with Mother Nature, Valentine's first foray into the spirit world produced award-winning Heppel Gin. Where did this love of the outdoors begin? I'll let him tell you. I grew up in Dorset in the 70s, um, very rural, um, still a county with no motorway, um, but then um, really um, kind of lost in the wilds um, in uh, Marshwood Vale. Um, very lucky to grow up there. It was, um, I, for many reasons, I grew up on an outside. Um, I always wanted to be outside. Um, there was a farm, so there's lots of things that little boys could smash and break. But then there was lots of things of interest. I had um, a father who was madly keen on the outdoors and told me lots of stories about chattering spirits in the hedgerows and the little woodland pixies and would always be coming through the door with handfuls of mushrooms to race onto toast or he would pick rose hips and make us cough mixture. And and then we all obviously had, you know, cattle and sheep, so there was meat and dairy and an extensive kitchen garden. And it was it was kind of wonderful. I think, it, you know, it, it was very exploratory place and was always to do with food right right from the very beginning. But your first love was art? My or first love it? no, my I don't uh I I I uh, School was problematic. I don't think any school was meant for me, nor was I meant for any school. And the art room was the only place that I really ever felt happy. And it's the only place I actually went without being required to go to a lesson. I was always in the art room. So, yes, I guess so. And I think because I failed so dismally in all my... It, it, I wanted to go to art college. And um, so that's where I headed. No the pictures that you drew were they of the outside they were a lot of the outside i didn't at the art college i actually ended up making kind of thatched um a little thatched i mean i did everything i, I drew i made um a thatched barn um with like wheels, the physical a not physical painting barn a little <laughs> barn with with wheels um that were made of um i think about 30 rabbits on each side cut out so it was like a big kind of uh you know, like a, a boat that would go up the Mississippi, but it went on land, and it had the insides of a photocopier inside it. And well, so it you drove said it had along. rabbits, though. You said it had rabbits. It had rabbits as wheels, and then it had the in, an engine in it. And then I made strange... I put the, uh, the parts of, a, of a, um, a food blender processor in a box with a, with a flipper from a um, pinball machine and then filled it with rocks so that when you turned it on... It spun around and fired rocks against this. Re- I mean, I mean, it was, and then I did draw it. No, I didn't. It, sca- oh, it was called. It was. I think it was called. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it scared the hell out of everybody. And then I did drawing, and my teachers were very frustrated because they wanted to position me, 
you know, do you draw, do you paint, do you... And art college wasn't about that for me. It was for doing anything that came into my mind. So I didn't play the game. I was kind of constantly the frustration of my teachers. And But I left art college as a portrait painter, and I think partly due to my parents, that got me started, and, you know, their connections, and then people started seeing those pictures. And then I kind of got a fair amount of work for two years of portrait painting. I think I was very good at it. I, I think I was told that I was good at it, and I got more work. But uh, discipline has always been a problem for me, and... Um, I grew up in a family obsessed by food. I read my mother's enormous collection of cookbooks. Um, I'd been to lots of restaurants, very simple offerings and very wonderful things, travelling around the world with my parents. And I realised that I'd always, from a tiny age, been fascinated by food. And I felt, I mean, and who feels this as a teenager, but or actually my early 20s, but I needed more discipline. And if I was going to be an artist, I just hadn't got enough discipline. And I thought, I thought about food a lot. So I went to see Alice. Were you always cooking? I was always home? cooking at home, constantly. And I think at Warner's view the world in terms of edible or inedible. Everything is divided like that. Um, when we eat, where somebody likened us to a pack of hyenas eating the carcass of a baby zebra. I'm so almost wearing, everything is edible. Everything. In your world. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went to see Alice a little, and I said, I don't know anything. I've had no training. Um, and I'll shut up and do what I'm told. And he said, fine, but not now. You go and find a job somewhere else. You oh. stick it out for a year or whatever. Then you come back, and when I can see that you can, you're can, you interested, then I'll give you a job. So I went to work at the Halcyon in the 90s, which was then you know, a, a, a great restaurant. Um, I wasn't that interested in the pursuit of a Michelin star. I found it far but too it, but rigorous. They're high-ended restaurants. It was, very, it was a very high-ended restaurant, but I didn't... I, uh, the, Martin was an amazing guy who took me under his wing, and I owe him a lot, but I didn't... I, I was more interested in the kind of food of, of Greek grandmothers, really. I went to see Alistair, and he said, right, you've proved yourself. Um, and, and that was really the start, and I didn't look back for six years, and then I went and worked in film and did a whole lot of other things, and had a catering company. So it was a mess. My, you know, There was no logical thing. But, and, and then by saying the right thing at the right time, which I seldom do, um, ended up on telly, which was the greatest enjoyment for me because it didn't require the, the I, I didn't want to learn how to run a restaurant you can't have you can't have a restaurant just by being good at cooking it's a recipe for disaster and I was especially if you're not disciplined especially if you're not disciplined I just wanted to cook and it's not enough and I didn't want to do staff rotors and I didn't want to worry about margins and rates and so at that a time when again I was going Christ what am I going to do um telly happened so it was the greatest privilege for me because it enabled me to cook um, it enabled me to travel, it enabled me to talk to people, but it didn't require me to have a restaurant. Now, for the show, did you get to say what kind of show it was? Could it be your God, no. unstructured show? I, no. I, I think I, I thought about this. I think, you know, were I to edit my own programs, would anyone watch them? Probably not. But in my experience, what I found is that... For an English audience, you know, the commissioners decide what goes out to them, understandably. But a lot of what ends up on the edit floor is what I would have actually put in the film. You send that out to a global audience and you find that that interest is there. If, BBC, you require me to put in a hole in, in a deer with a rifle, then surely you should film the taking out of its guts and seeing the whole thing through. But no, that never got in. What would you like to do? I'd like to film goat. You know, there's a huge Afro-Caribbean and Indian population here. We'd rather you do lamb. What else would you like to film? Well, I'd like to oh, do broad sure. beans. No, we'd like you to do peas. But everybody eats peas and lambs, but nobody knows anything about broad beans and goats. So, Of course, this was a while ago, it, This right? was a while ago, and it was very frustrating. But, you know, who was I? You know, I was told, you know, don't get a reputation for being difficult to work with, mm. so I jumped. Every time somebody told me to be jumped, in, in hindsight now, where I think the great potential is in, in online, is that we are a super sanitised nation when it comes to eating. You don't have to go far to see that people eat in a completely different way. My children live in the Pyrenees. You know, everything there is very local. People understand what grows around them. And it, it's only here that we eat in this very rigorous kind of, as I say, you don't go far. And there's this wonderful world, true understanding of food, and normally carried in more rural environments. That's where my interest lies. But that was very hard at the time here to get off the ground. And so I think, you know, now online is the place really to where, 
you quickly realise that those things that you do want to put in, there is an audience for them and actually a much larger audience, obviously. Well, as you grew more popular, were you able to say, have a little bit, you know, dictate more? No, like, I think I was irritating. Um, I was green. I was uh, at moments outspoken. I, I wasn't thinking in a grown-up way. I was thinking, in a, ooh, isn't this fun? Um, and, you know, uh, um, I'm earning some money at last and ha-ha-ha, let's go and have a party. And I wasn't thinking right. Mm-hmm. Now, in hindsight, being a latecomer to everything I do in my life, I would have done it incredibly differently. And I would have shut my mouth a little bit more to, I guess, in turn, get what you want further down the line. So uh, did I handle it very well? No. Was I upset when it came to an end? Yes. What would I have to do to, you know... Unfortunately, now I don't really bake and I'm not that interested in competitions. So I think the window's closed for me at the moment. Yet I feel on some level I still have held an audience out there which trust my knowledge of ingredients. They appreciate my understanding of nature as well as the cultivated. And, you know, um, and I think, you know, who knows what comes around again. But I, I don't think I, I, I was thinking straight at the time. Well, now you're in the spirit world. I've moved from solids into liquids. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us how that happened. Um, I think that I've always done a lot of different things. Um, and television, there has been a continuation of things that I was doing, consulting work and writing, things like that. But I kind of took stock and thought, you know, I've always been a little monkey playing the cymbals and dancing on top of the organ, wearing my fez hat. And I don't want to be that person anymore. And I want something that is more mine and actually comes out of a place which is more to do with my understanding than someone else's. Um, I was with my oldest friend, Walter, um, who I've known since I was um, eight or nine. And we were walking across Heppel, which is the, the land where, where his house is. It's also the name of the village close to us. Talking the, about the shifting sands in our lives... Um, and then suddenly, I, I think it was really jogged by Nick Strangeway. Nick is a very important barman and somebody I'd met before this little story I'm telling you. And we found a, we were going to make an alternative to um, bison grass using an English plant. And then for various reasons to do with the, what's acceptable in the US and what's acceptable here, we decided not to. So there was already a kind of conversation about drinks going on, and then I got up to Heppel. Wait, was he was he going to use this bison grass? In we, his we, I took the I kind of went to him with food? it, and we said, "Hey, let's do this together. Okay. Let, let's use because I need your drinks expertise, but I know the plant that we can okay. use it for." So Nick and, and I've kind of known Nick. So for, it was always with drinks in mind. This uh, uh, yes, it was grass. because you know drinks and food they come together. Okay. You know they're part of the same thing. You don't really separate them. Mm-hmm. There, you know, you you eat, you drink. Um, but that didn't go anywhere, and but. The, the seed had been planted, and then I was with Walter on the side of um, uh, the Simon Side Hills, walking and talking, and so I kind of noticed that we were surrounded by juniper bushes all over the side of the hill. There was the whole place is a, you know, to do with water, squelch, 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 and little rivulets running everywhere of crystal bright water, and and then you kind of look at the ground, and there's you know. It's covered in wild herbs that I know. And we were suddenly kind of walking in this kind of distiller's Eden, really. And I just said, well, look, you've got all these empty barns where little more goes on inside them than, you know, owls killing mice. And we've got a property that's empty. We've got a hillside covered in potential. We've got junipers. We've got water. I mean, it's under our nose. So meet Nick. So Nick came up with his business partner who'd, um, you know, trained in biochemistry and stuff. And, and we had a, a really amazing weekend of clinking glasses and crackling fires and talking and walking. And, and it was the longest conversation I've ever had in my life because, you know, three years later and, you know, we have, you know, Heppel Gin. The, the first, we are not, I, I might add here, a, a gin company. We're a spirits business and our first product is a gin. Did you always know that it was going to be gin? You saw the junipers and said that. No, there was a, there was a, a kind of funny moment because we all said, shall we make a gin? And we all kind of said, but we'd be mad to make a gin. I mean, look what's going on. It's not, you know, to jump on the bandwagon is just, there isn't a bandwagon. It, it's kind of madness. You can hear the audible jingle of all these hundreds of offerings already. I mean, talk about last ones to the party. But Nick and I 
it, because we like to, everyone at Heppel likes to make life difficult for themselves, um, or the Morland Spirits Company. And we said, but, you know, Nick and I said, look, gin is about juniper. I think there's a lot of digression because people know how busy the market is. So, of course, black currant needs to go into it or rhubarb or whatever. And this is to kind of, you know, make it in this battle. Um, but at the same time, we feel that, you know, while some things are kind of almost you taste the cardamom before the juniper, we, we, we want to make our expression of juniper. And Nick and I had a very strong idea that the juniper is a very interesting plant and it's got a lot to do with juniper itself. It, it has unripe and ripe berries on the female plants at any one time. And we thought, well, if all juniper is made from, um, I mean, if all gin is made from ripe juniper, you're kind of seeing one end of, of the juniper. So why don't we do some exploration with the green juniper and we'll pick it when it's unripe and then we'll mix it with the ripe juniper because do you get two different tastes? Yes, you do. The, the green juniper is very kind of alive and jumpy and peppery and green and crunchy and it's mm. wonderful. And then you've got the, the more mature tastes of the older one. And we want to show the whole life of juniper and to get people to think about juniper again. Um, after a few kind of tests, Carebury, who's um, very importantly said, guys, to make the gin that you want to make, we need to look at different equipment for very delicate plants on this moorland, which get, you know, um, can't survive the heat of the copper pot still. If we put them through a, um, a glass vacuum still, which has a, a, a vacuum, mm -hmm. then you lower the point of, um, you lower the boiling point of alcohol considerably. So very delicate plants can give up their goodies um, in a you know a lower boiling point which they can't so this machine arrived so you've got the copper pot still for smoothness you need mm -hmm. the copper then we had you know the rotor vap rotor evaporator glass vacuum still whatever you want to call it which was for freshness and then we wanted to get a really kind of long lasting juniper taste and so then this mad idea came that we'd investigate something called super critical co2 extraction which is normally used in the perfume industry, which is a very logical place to look because, you know, if we're interested in taste, then look towards the people who are also interested in tastes and smells and things, the perfume industry. So this mad bit of equipment, it turned out that one of the only kind of um, retailers of it in the country happened to be outside Newcastle. So, I mean, it, there's so much serendipity mm -hmm. going on. Um, also that we got Sipsmith's ex-head distiller who'd moved to Newcastle. So we kind of grabbed him as quickly as we could. So... Um, and this machine, uh, using super pressurized carbon dioxide, when you put it under pressures that could fold a car like a napkin, I mean, 3,000 PSI, um, you, you squash carbon dioxide um, to its supercritical state and it becomes a gas and a liquid at the same point, uh, at the same time. And that kind of permeates deep into the juniper in it and you get the most wonderful deep, those kind of oud, uh, cedarwood and sandalwood tastes that you can't from conventional distilling. This is an extraction. And that's for you, it's this kind of very long resonating juniper taste. You taste juniper with apple. And then we had to match everything up. So we've got three machines rather than one. We tried every ingredient and every combination to make matters even more complicated. The, the two junipers we used, we used three junipers, the, the Heppel unripe, but then we used two ripe ones. Now we ate every pretty much type of juniper that you can get that's produced from Croatia to Italy to, and we settled on these two. And then everything had to go through all the machines so we know how they all came out and then they had to be mixed. So we, Nick and I were drunk for a year and a half. Um, and drinking a lot of coffee and it was quite a mad time and I think we were sobbing by a dry stone wall in a Northumberland gale going, oh my god, we've spent all this money what have we done? When Carebury came running out of the distillery and went, taste this, taste this, taste this. I, thought, I, I think we might have, have got there and so it was mad it was hair, the but whole juniper is only one ingredient juniper is only you, one ingredient you as a cook and chef must have wanted to throw every, you know, oh my God, there's all of these, where do you start? Well, that's you know? really wonderful. It's, I'm so glad you said that. <gasps> I, think it, I think it's very easy to make the mistake because you've got stuff, you feel you should use it. Um, we had other things such as heather um, that we could put in, but they just didn't work. And you, destroying is as important as creating. Mm -hmm. We come from a place where I like to call Heppel a cold climate gin. Um, it, it's bright, it's fresh, it's invigorating. It's it's kind of like a kind of silver shiver when you drink it. 
And it's from this place. There is no point in us um, finding, you know, searching the four corners of the earth for rarefied spices because it has no reason to be there. Mm -hmm. um, we have enough. Um, you know, if you know that the junipers are, you know, growing under the shade of the Douglas fir trees and from the Douglas fir you can see the lovage growing in the kitchen garden next to the black, black currants, that there is your environment. Um, so it's kind of a site specific. It is site specific. Yeah. It's a lovely way to put it. And uh -huh. we kind of, even the coriander seed, I mean, there are things like licorice. I mean, a mouthy lemons is an important one because if we just put lemons in our gin, they could come from anywhere. They will be different every time we get them. If you put a mouthy lemons in, then you know you have a consistent product, which also wonderfully happens to be the most perfumed of all the lemons. Licorice, you know, we, we've gone to Lacrids who make amazing licorice products in, um, in Denmark to get there. So very few things do come out of the distillery, but for the things there, I mean, the, the coriander seed just so happened without knowing that the ones we really liked are coriander seeds that were produced in the UK, so that was just wonderfully convenient. But um, we've tried to keep as much to do with that place as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and to import as, as you know, and as bring as little onto it from elsewhere, because you know it's in front of us. And I think we could have taken it one stage further. Who knows what we'll release in the future? But you could do a Heppel only, um, you know, nothing from you know. But mm -hmm. it's see what you've got, understand the place, find out what it's famous for, find out what its history is find out and then that's how you link your things together some might come from further afield but there has to be a logical reason and Heppel gives us so much I mean we rather tritely kind of say mother nature is our business partner but it's why we're you know that more piece of moorland um, in the middle of Northumberland National Park um, you know supports our company therefore you know we're putting a lot of juniper back on the moor um, we're, we're lo we look after that place. There will be a point where we can't stress that place out more. We know what that mm. point is. We're not going to go on saying, right, take, 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 you know. So, you know, wonderfully, we'll be able to make other things too. Um, but, you know, we, we do look after the place we're from. And it's beautiful. And it's an amazing place to work. And while you're m making gin, you can hear all the curlews <laughs> flying in as mm -hmm. they're coming in now in spring. And it's a place that is... It's a place of contrast. You know, we are tweed and tattoos. We've got Nick and we've got Walter. Um, and then you have the madness of London, you know, Instagram, bars, da. And then you go up to this place which is so quiet. And it's an amazing reset. And although it's a long way away and there are pressures of travelling five hours every time I want to go up there when you're there. And you breathe that air in and you listen to the curlews and you go to the distillery you know, you, you see sense when you're there, especially, you know, from the things in your life, but also the products we might want to make. So about the products you might want to make, mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little insight into what mm. you're going to create next, uh, or is that a secret? Um, we, we are plodders. Um, we, um, we haven't made life easy for ourselves. Um, it takes, you know, eight times longer to make Heppel than it does to make a traditional gin, which would be bottled straight from the still. Um, and new products, yes, there will be, you know, in the next year, there will be, you know, we, we stay quiet for ages and then suddenly there's a rash of stuff. Um, you know, there will be two new things coming. Well, it takes a long time to make some things. It so. takes a long time to make some things. Also, we've got to scamper up trees and, you know, go and snip stuff and take it back and dry it. But, I mean, clues are... You know, there's going to be a hedgerow-y stuff coming out. And that was really seeing the same bird at two different times of year um, go to two different bushes and then go, well, that bird's enjoying those two things, so what would they like mm -hmm. to get? Um, and the other one has a tree, um, which is solely based yeah, a on... A tree it. and a hedge, which would look out um, for. So there's a hedge thing coming, <laughs> and then there's a thing which has actually only got one ingredient in it, um, which is a tree... Um, but then put through our three different machines, which is oh. is absolutely um, I'm I'm very ex I'm excited about both of them. But the tree one is um, quite bonkers. Okay. This may be a trade question, but um, do you ever miss being in the kitchen now? I because you're around a lot of scientific apparatus. I, I um yes, I think it, it's a it's a shame in a way that people say because you now distill it means you don't cook and. You know, I'm a man of appetites. I like both. I love cooking. 
um, like very few things in my life, like fishing, it, it's second nature. Um, I understand ingredients, um, and I'm, uh, I love food. Um, so when people say, well, now you're a distiller, you don't really cook, I find that very frustrating. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to frustrate you. No, 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 you. you're, no, you're not, but I, I, but I think it, it You does. are now your business. No, it is modern well, life. I think, it, you know, people get... People, we all need to be put in little boxes. And oh, I just I, put I, you in a box and forget that. No, 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 don't forget it because I think it, I think it's a very good point that we, we, you know, uh, my intra, you know, food and drink come together, and and I and I do both, and well, I'd like to cook more. Um, but at the moment, you know, I have a, bus- a distillery business that's growing and I need to concentrate. Well, I guess what it is for me was that you were creating with your hands. Okay. Mm. Uh, th- this is how I see it. This is why I asked. You were creating something with your hands. Okay. As a, as a cook, I see it. It's, you're kind of still being an artist. You're mm. an artist with that. And then it's moved more now into your brain and... I don't know. Maybe that's totally well, wrong. I guess you're still using your tongue. I, I right? God, you're I use my tongue far taste. too much. Um, I right. love my hands in the soil. I like nature. I like I like the visceral. Uh-huh. I'm unsqueamish. I I think you should understand things in their raw state and their cooked state. I I enter into things like Instagram and Twitter, but I have you know because I feel I'm required to in this modern world. Give me the choice. I'd rather be holding a mossy stick in my hand than a phone. Um, so. You know, but I, I like making stuff. I and I, I like putting stuff in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. Uh, gosh, I've never ended this way. But uh, why don't we put some Heffel in our mouth? Great. <laughs> All right. Sound good. Yeah. Oh wait, 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 wait! Before we have that drink, do you think those woodland spirits that your father talked of? Do you think they would be drinking Heffel? If they could get into the distillery. Um, which they probably can. They teleport all over the place. Um, maybe they would, but I kind of feel that the woodland spirits are drinking things that I'd be privileged to know. Then we'd really, really be onto something because they know all sorts of secrets about nature that um, we're still clueless about. All right. Well, I want to sneak in to the to the distillery and try some of your hepo. And the closest way I can do that is having a drink now. Well, maybe so if we one? unlocked the door at three o'clock in the morning, you'd hear lots of cheeky little laughing voices, and then they'd be lying, or well, lots of tiny little bodies littered all over the distillery. You never know. Smashed. Someone listening to this now <laughs> might just do that, so be careful. All right, let's open some. Great. I so appreciate the time Valentine took to meet with me, and I can't wait to hear about all the new products he's creating. Remember, you heard it here first, hedgerow and tree. We were toasting to the great outdoors with a sip of Heppel gin when Valentine began describing the actual liquid inside the bottle. I stopped him and turned on the mic. Um, We've tried very hard to make a very very clean alcohol that you don't get a kind of big whack at the front end is very pure is very um is very bright and clean and flavorful and as you say site specific of that place um there's a wonderful purity to heppel and i you know so much so that i i actually like drinking with soda water um or, or neat um because it's very very acceptable as neat um, as a neat drink, and you get wonderful tastes of pine and, and juniper, and juniper happens also to be a, a, a pine. Um, so it, it's a really, it's what I, I call it a cold climate gin of extreme clarity and freshness, and I think it's, it's unusual helpful for that. Now it's time for our cocktail of the week. Our cocktail of the week is the Heppel Martini. Start with 10 parts Heppel gin and one part dry vermouth. Pour all the ingredients into a mixing glass filled with ice. Then stir slowly, 30 times. Strain it into a chilled glass, then garnish with a small twist of lemon peel. Of course, you can always drink it straight or with tonic if you prefer. You'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week on alushlifemanual.com where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. If you've liked what you've heard, don't forget to nominate us for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award. You'll find all the details on my site. Next episode will be in London, 
at a brand new bar that was inspired by the torrid affair between Lady Charlotte Louisa Fitzrovia and Lock and Walla's notorious street boss VJ. Find out all the dirty details then. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast, the sister of A Lush Life Manual. For more information and links to everything you heard, plus a bit more, please visit alushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra. And I'm your hostess, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar.